saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good, and all the time. Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good. Say amen for God. His mercy is everlasting. The proof of God's mercy is that you and I are alive this very moment. I believe in exercise, I believe in good nutrition, I believe in vitamins and supplements, but let me tell you, it is God that keeps us alive. Exercise, do your sit-ups, push-ups, take your vitamin E, drink your soy milk, your sorrel, but it is God that keeps you alive. And I thank God for the gift of life and for this privilege, this holy honor, of fellowshipping with you this evening. And I pray that God will use me to the extent that I will not be seen nor heard 
but Christ will be seen and Christ heard because he alone is a savior how are you it's nice to see you you look like nice people if I'm right say amen God is good and all the time our subject for this evening I need help what did I say do three favors for me favor number one if you're not using one of these things as a Bible please uh, make sure it's turned off mine is I hope so that there's no interference and no disturbance of the spirit of reverence which God deserves favor number two while I'm speaking pray for me and say Lord put your words in that man's mouth Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth we have his hand that's divine we have my mouth that's human the successful proclamation of the gospel the successful living of an upright life requires the combination of the divine and the human then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the Lord said unto me behold I have put my words in thy mouth tonight in the presence of the recording angel I say I only want to speak the words of God and his prophet favor number three think as you listen Isaiah 118 come now let us reason together saith the Lord I've often said I will always say it if people would stop and think they would not eat some of the things they eat if people would stop and think they would not drink some of the things they drink if people would stop and think they would not date some of the people they date is this microphone working okay <laughs> just checking on the electronics think let's bow our heads dear God we come before you in the name of Jesus a name you always accept because he is equal with you we come dear God also because we have no other place to go we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ receive us dear God wrap us in your arms and draw us into your bosom the safest place in the universe where we've sinned forgive us God you're not a God who holds grudges as we do forgive us with that forgiveness dear God give us power to avoid the sins I present myself to you dear God and I ask you use me suppress my carnal nature which loves attention suppress it and let your glory be my only business I think of your words in Isaiah 42 verse 8 I am the Lord that is my name my glory will I not give to another take the glory father but give us what we need so desperately that is the blessings bless our guests sister Evadne brother Stanley we're glad they're present bless them bless their families provide their needs save them when you come dear God and if there's anyone listening online bless those two I pray bless this country father and remind the leaders that the most high ruleth in the kingdoms of men now father I commit this service to your glory in Jesus name I pray amen Hebrews chapter 11 we'll read from verse 4 our subject I need help Hebrews 11 reading from verse 4 I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible when you found it say amen and I can't wait all night for you to find it so you must move quickly by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous God testifying of his gifts and by it he being dead yet speaketh by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain to the extent that God became a witness to the righteousness of Abel and you can have no higher witness to an upright life than God himself verse 5 by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death 
and was not found because God had translated him. But for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. By faith, a remarkable thing occurred. A man was taken from earth straight to heaven, never having seen death. Faith. We go through that entire chapter. By faith, verse 7, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared a house to the saving, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By faith, by faith. What is this faith that is so indispensable? Let us go to, his, let's go to verse 6 of Hebrews 11. Our subject, I need help. Verse 6. But without faith, come on, you can say it, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him by faith. Without faith, nothing will happen in the area of salvation. He that cometh unto God must, it is non-negotiable. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Did Jesus need faith? Yes. Let's reason together by going to John chapter 8. Let's read verse 29, our subject, I need help. John 8, reading verse 29. Have you found it? And he that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Finish that verse for me. For I do always those things, come on, that please him. Now, keep this in mind as you recall Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is. Now, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, the only way to please God is by faith. Jesus said in John 8, 29, all my life I do what pleases God. Then how did Jesus live? By faith. Because the only way to please God is by faith. And Jesus said, I please my Father. Consequently, Jesus lived by faith. Because he was as human as you and I are. As you reflect on the texts we read, someone may be led to believe that faith is something that functions independent of God. I just need to exercise faith, and once I do that, then anything can happen. Then I become my own miracle worker simply by exercising faith. But I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark 9. No, not, not, let's not go to Mark 9 yet. Let's go to Romans 12. Romans 12. Is faith all that you need? And does faith alone save you, even though the Bible seems to say that? But when reading the Bible, we must go beneath the surface. What book did I say? What chapter? 12, reading verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think how? Soberly, finish the verse, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, which means faith is a gift. Faith originates from God, not from man. So when you and I exercise genuine faith, not presumption, when God parted the Red Sea, he called the Israelites across. They responded in faith because faith essentially is total surrender to the Word of God. What God says I do, that's faith. He called them, they responded in faith. They were saved. He did not call the Egyptians. They tried to cross. The entire army was destroyed. That is presumption. That is not faith. Even though to the naked eye, the two actions seem similar. They were. The Israelites entered. They crossed. The Egyptians entered. But the difference lay in the fact that the first group, they entered at the call of God. The second group was not called by God. Faith is not presumption. Presumption rests upon me. Faith rests upon thus saith the Lord. Can you say amen? amen? Now, 
Let us go to Mark 9. Our subject, I need help. Let me pray again. Holy Father, be with me as I try to represent you to the best of my ability. Keep me humble. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you have Mark 9? We read from verse 21. This is the story of the epileptic boy whom the Israelites, not the Israelites, the disciples could not heal. Christ was in the Mount of Transfiguration with three of the disciples. The other nine were at the base of the mountain getting into a controversy because they could not heal this boy who had been brought to Christ by the Father. Christ descends the mountain. He inquires what's going on. Then he asked the father, and he said, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Verse 22 of Mark 9. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the water fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion upon us. Come on, finish the verse. And help us. What's our subject? I need help. Straightway, at the Father, when Jesus said, when the Father said, have compassion on us, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst, give me another word for believe, faith. If you can demonstrate faith, all things are possible to him that believeth or exercises faith. Verse 24, and straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, finish the verse, Lord I believe. What does that mean? I have faith. But finish the verse. Have thou my unbelief. Now, every expression of human faith requires help. I didn't say that clearly. Listen to the words of that man again. Lord, gee, what did Jesus tell him in verse 23? If thou canst believe. In other words, Christ is literally saying, have faith. The man said, I have faith. I believe. But my belief can only take me so far. There must be divine intervention. The Christian does not rely on his or her faith. The Christian relies on God. And so the father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Ellen White says, when you pray that prayer, help my unbelief, you cannot perish. Because you are acknowledging your helplessness and the limitless power of God. Help my unbelief. Every expression of faith, in order to be effective, requires divine assistance. Faith and Works, page 50, paragraph 1. What did I say? Faith and Works, page 50, paragraph 1. I'm well aware this is a youth weekend, but as I said yesterday, the gospel has no age limit. Not as hell, not as heaven. Are you following me? The soul that sinneth, it shall die regardless of age. Are you with me? All right. Faith is not the end all and everything. As I tried to say earlier, we need intervention from God in order that the faith exercise may bring about whatever it is we desire. Let us go to Luke 7. Luke 7. In this chapter, a woman washes the feet of Christ with her tears. She wipes her feet, his feet, with the hairs on her head and anoints the feet with ointment. And those who were sitting by at the dinner, they were outraged that the Christ would allow this. Christ rebukes them properly. Then he tells the woman in verse 48 of Mark 7, he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman in the last verse of that chapter, What did he say? Thy faith, come on, have saved thee, come on, go in peace. Look at verse 48. What does verse 48 say? Thy sins are forgiven thee. The only way to have peace with God is to have sins removed. Uh, you're not with me. 
The only way to have peace with God is not to have an oversized bank account, as good as that is. I wish I had one. The only way to be at peace with God is to have sins removed. Now, Jesus said in verse 48, thy sins are forgiven. She had that peace in verse 48. The, the onlookers in verse 49 did not understand that. So when they complain, Jesus said in verse 50, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. The only way to be saved is to be saved from, come on, sin. But who saved her from sin in verse 48? Come on, you're too slow. Who? Jesus. So when he said, Thy faith has saved thee, it is Jesus who saves, but in response to the exercise of faith I have to say that again I hope someone has already said Lord put your words in that man's mouth that request is very urgent when I make it Christ forgave her in verse 48 a forgiven person is saved a forgiven person is whole in the eyes of God you may have one leg and one eye, but in the eyes of God, spiritually, you are whole. Jesus made her whole in verse 48. Jesus did it. Now, verse 50 lets us know he did it in response to her faith. Go to Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, the shortest gospel. We read the last verse of Mark 10. Christ opening the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus. Jesus said to him, go thy way, thy faith, come on, have made thee whole. Mm -hmm. Now, when Jesus called him, Jesus said, what will thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Are you following me? Now, if he only by the use of faith could have restored his sight, there would have been no need for Jesus. I want you to understand Jesus responds to the exercise of faith. But you're saved by Christ. And nobody said amen. <laughs> We're saved by Christ now. Having said that, let's learn a little about Christ. Are you with me? Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, tomorrow night, invite someone to come with you, please. One person brings one person, but you'll have to put down chairs all over the place. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from verse 1. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning, finish it for me, with the first day. Question for you, who said, let there be light? Well, I can't say you're wrong if you say God. But the Godhead is Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Let me ask you again. Who said, let there be light? Jesus Christ. Now, he wasn't called Christ back then. He assumed that name, which reflects his office, when he came in human condition. You see, his name is Jesus. His office is Christ. You see, a Savior, the Anointed One. It was Christ who said, let there be light. Now, listen to verse 1 again of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Say that differently for me. Christ created the heaven and the earth. This is the person who can help you with sin. What's our subject? I need help. <laughs> you and I need help. You and I need help conquering sin. 
Now, the reason why I want us to take a look at Jesus, there's a widespread belief within Christianity, and sadly, Adventism, it is impossible to conquer sin completely. When you say that, you are casting aspersions on the character of Jesus Christ. It is impossible for a human being to conquer sin in his or her own power. But the Bible rebukes those of us who, occupy, who uh, adopt that satanic doctrine that Christ, that you and I cannot conquer sin. The Bible rebukes it with Jude chapter 1 verse 24. Now unto him that is able to do what? Keep you from falling. Unto him who is this him? Give me a name for that him. Jesus Christ, the one who said, let there be light. Jesus Christ. It's the only way you and I can conquer sin. As Christians, we believe that Christ is coming back. If you believe that, say amen. Well, let us live as if we believe it. <laughs> I'm serious. Let me digress a little bit. Then I'll get back to describing the power of Christ. As for man, his days are as grass. Are you with me? short as psalm 103 verse 15 his days as grass as the flower of the field so it flourishes the wind passes over it it is gone and the place shall know it no more that's your lifetime now and mine eternal life is this are you with me this present life is this eternal life is this we spend most of our time taking care of this. And then we say we're preparing for this. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And the person it deceives is the person who has it. That's you and me. It does not deceive God. It does not deceive the devil. It deceives you. And it deceives me. This is our present life. We spend little time securing this. But let me get back to the power of Jesus Christ. Let's go to John chapter 11. Let's read verse 43. What does that clock say? Is that 10 after 8? Is that what it says? What do your watches say on your wrists? 10 past 8. All right. I promised you by 8.30, so we are 20 minutes away, I think. Do you have John 11? Nobody answered the preacher. All right, do you have verse 43? Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue. Please give me simple and direct language, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Next verse. And he that was dead did what? came forth bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. Jesus, this man, this God who is man, has the power to reverse death. You and I go to funerals of friends and family. I've lost my father, my mother, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my younger brother, a spiritual brother, uh, uh, my favorite cousin, a niece. I've lost people. Are you talking? You're listening to me. I stood before caskets, realizing there's nothing I could do. If there were something I could have done, I would have raised that person. I have stood at the bedside of sick people, family, friends, nothing I could do. Jesus Christ can reverse death. Jesus Christ can cancel the worst diseases because Jesus Christ is very God and with God nothing come on shall be impossible including your sins and mine that weakness that has enslaved you for decades all it needs is the involvement of Jesus Christ and your and my total surrender Creating the universe is an expression of the power of Jesus Christ. That wasn't hard work. The most remarkable thing Christ can do is to create 
a spiritual being out of a sinner. That's miracle number one. Are you with me? Now, there are a lot of churches that specialize in miracles, and people flock because they're like miracles that appeal to the senses. I see it, I hear it, I touch it, smell it, feel it, taste it. The miracle that applies to the sense of faith, which is the higher sense, that is where transformation of life occurs. This is where resurrection from the dead occurs. And so the Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 1, You have he quickened who are what? Dead in trespasses and sins. There must be a combination of I believe that Jesus Christ can deliver me. That faith plus the personal involvement of Jesus Christ. Lord, I believe. Finish that verse. Help thou my unbelief. What is my title for this evening? I need help to conquer pornography. I need help to stop cheating on my exams in school. I need help to stop my lying. I need help to conquer pride. That help has a name, J-E-S-U-S. -S. What's that? Jesus, who works in response to our faith. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Look at the power that God uses to work in our lives. Ephesians 1, we read verse 19. Paul is praying that the Ephesian church would understand certain things about God and what God does with respect to the plan of salvation. Verse 19 of Ephesians 1. Have you found it? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who? Believe. So we have power and we have belief. Now let's read those words again. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? Stop. That's one thing. The power. To usward who? Ah, there's the faith. The power moves toward the faith. Are you with me? According to the what? Working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. What is Paul saying? The power God unleashes to deliver you and me from the bondage of sin is the same power that brought Jesus Christ from the dead. Then how can you say it is not possible for a believer to conquer sin? Let me say again, to say that is to charge God with weakness. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and deliverance from sin is verily a resurrection. Let me say it again. I, there are people in the church who have been tied up with ropes in one sin or another who perhaps have come to the place I can never conquer this sin and you're right I cannot conquer it nor can you they do not pause to consider there is a person who if I cooperate with him will give me the victory over that sin to the glory of God and to my amazement I need help. If I just exercise faith and Christ does nothing, that faith will avail me nothing. It is faith and divine intervention. And so the Father said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. In Steps to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2, what did I say? Listen very carefully. If you give yourself to him, who is him? Jesus. And accept him as your savior. Why do you and I need a savior? From sin. Christ is not a savior necessarily from poverty.
because he didn't die because people were poor. Ah, you're not listening. He died, he did not die because a woman had difficulty getting a husband. Or a man, a wife. Or a woman, a child. These things are not sin. I am not saying they are desirable, they are not sin. Because Christ was poor. Let me say, I'm not promoting poverty. I'm simply saying Christ did not die because people are poor. He died because of sin. Listen again to the quotation. If you give yourself to him, let's examine that. If you give yourself to him, who now possesses you? He does, because you have given yourself away. Ah, you're not with me. Give yourself to him and don't take it back. And accept him as your savior, meaning you believe he has the power to deliver you, to save you from what you cannot overcome, that sin. Then sinful though your life may have been, for his sake, you're counted righteous. You need time to wrap your mind around that concept. For his sake, you are counted righteous. If I traveled with President Biden and I'm going through security, I don't have to go through security. Why? Because for his sake, I'm considered safe. Are you with me? No, you're not with me. You're with me? <laughs> for his sake, I'm considered a secure. A, I'm not considered a risk because I'm with him. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful though your life may have been, for his sake, you're counted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. The problem is, nobody believes that. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let the Bible strengthen that quotation. Let us go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus 1, let's read from verse 1 our subject, I need help. It's 20 after 8. When did I say I'd let you go? Only God's word cannot be broken. <laughs> God is good <laughs> and all the time. Leviticus 1, let's read from verse 1. Are you there? Yes. Let me pray, Father, I'm coming to the end, but don't end your help towards me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and saying to them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle and of the herd, even of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer what? A male, come on, without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Now, verse 4. And he shall do what? Put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be what? Accepted for him to do what? Make atonement for him. Pause. The animal represents whom? Christ. The sinner brings Christ. <laughs> Come on. He brings symbolically Christ. We bring ourselves. And God says, no, 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 no. <laughs> bring me Christ who represents you. You cannot represent yourself before God. Bring Christ. But don't stand next to Christ. Stand in him. Mm -hmm. If you stand next to him, God has a plain view of you. <laughs> ah, nobody's with me. But if you come in him, whom does the Father see? Jesus. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be what? Accepted 
for him. <laughs> you see, he should be the one about to have his throat slit. That animal is accepted for him. To make atonement for him. Because you cannot make an atonement for yourself. Now we notice in verse 3, he shall bring, let, let him bring a male without blemish. He brings the animal to the priest. The priest has to examine if it is indeed without spot or blemish. Follow me now. I may need five extra minutes. Can I have them say yes? All right. Here comes the sinner with the animal. Who does this priest examine? The animal. Not the man. Ah. Nobody. Nobody said amen. The priest examines the animal. It is clear the man has spots. That's why he brought the animal. No need wasting time. He examines the animal because the animal will stand in place of that man. And so you've got to take Jesus and bring him to God. Saying, I accept his sacrifice, his perfect life, his voluntary death, the fact that he raised himself, his victory over death, hell, sin, the grave, and Satan, all of that you say when you bring Christ. But you bring him by abiding in him. When Christ stands before the Father and you're in him, the Father sees Jesus. And you're safe. But that man must bring, he must bring the animal. It cannot be brought for him. Your mother cannot save you. God bless your mother. She's a saint. She cannot save you. Young man, young woman. Your father may have been head deacon, head elder, head everything. He cannot save you. You've got to bring Jesus. Who, by the way, was 17. Hmm? Christ was 14. He was 21. And since he pre-existed, he was 2 million. It shall be accepted for him to make an atonement for him. I need help. That help is Christ. But Christ says to me in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me. All ye that labor. And that labor is not working hard as an accountant because that's not what you need to be delivered from. The labor that you and I need to be delivered from is laboring, come on, with sin. Do you understand sin? And there's a God who can deliver you and me from all sin. And so he says, now unto him that is able to do to, to keep you from falling and to present you how faultless without sin. But that sinlessness is the sinlessness of Christ credited to you. When you give yourself to him, and that giving must be how? One hundred percent. And so Jesus told the scribe in Mark 12, verse 29, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might, with all thy strength, everything you have given to Christ. Then and only then can he stand in your place and do for you what you and I cannot do for ourselves. I need help. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. There is victory promised. If someone tells you you cannot conquer sin in this life, say, excuse me, and leave before you start believing that nonsense. All things are possible to him that believeth, believeth in Jesus. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh. Overcometh what? Sin. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? even as I also overcame and I'm set down with my father 
in his throne. Question becomes, how did Jesus overcome sin? We close by going to John 14 very quickly. Let's go there. It's 8.20-something. Let's go to John 14. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night with those whom you bring. John 14, let's read from verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that have seen me have seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that what? I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Now this was the way it was for Christ. That's the way it must be with us and Jesus. Jesus in us, we in Jesus. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Finish the verse. He doeth the works. When Christ dwells in you, he works through your efforts to resist sin. I'm choosing my words carefully. What did I say? He works through your efforts. And sin is conquered. Faith and Works, page 50, paragraph 1. When it is in the heart, where? In the heart. Not the, the, the spleen or the liver. In the heart. To obey God. And efforts are put forth toward this end. That effort comes from me. Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best. That's the best he can do. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. You didn't hear me. Well, you didn't hear the servant of the Lord. When it is in the heart to obey God, not the lips, this Huh? That's where God writes the law under the new covenant. He writes it on the heart. When it is in the heart to obey God, like Daniel said, he purposed in his heart not to defile his body. You make up your mind you're going to kill that man who took your wife. You make up your mind this, your mind that. When it is in the heart to obey God. And efforts are put forth toward this end. And God watches you try. Christ accepts this disposition and effort as man's best. In other words, that's the best he can do. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Because no degree of faith by itself is sufficient. There must be divine intervention. And so Jesus says to you, bring your spousal abuse to me. I'll give you victory. The Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Come on, you know it. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I cannot explain how Christ lives in me, accepted by faith. I have seen people in whom demons lived. I couldn't explain it, but I saw the evidence. Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live by the, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's how Jesus lived. John 14, 10, the Father was in him. And that's how you and I are to live. Jesus Christ in us. I need help. That help is Jesus Christ responding to the... Lit you don't have to have a lot of faith. You just have to exercise all that you have. I didn't say that clearly. Ladies, maybe the men know this. You know what a thimble is? A thimble, you put it on your finger when you're sewing. Here's a thimble. Here is a bucket. Are you following me? If you have a thimble of faith, God says, bring that. And I'll fill it. If this man has a bucket, God says, bring that. I will fill it. If that man who has a bucket of faith brings a thimble to God, God does nothing. Or such a little that it amounts to, very, to nothing. All God wants is whatever faith you have, put it in me by giving yourself to me. And the operative word is give, not loan. You see, when God gave his son for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Christ is not alone. Christ is a gift. 
That's why he still has human form. He is a gift. He will have human form forever. He's a gift to us, not to the angels. Not to unfallen worlds. He's a gift to us. And it's a permanent, irreversible gift. And by accepting that gift, yielding ourselves to that gift every day, that divine gift works through us to give us the victory that we ourselves can never achieve. You do not need Christ to live a decent life. You can do that by yourself. Most atheists are decent. But to live a victorious life over sin, you need Jesus Christ. Are you following me? How many of you will say with me tonight, Father, thank you for your simple word. As far as I can, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Can I see your hand? Now, do you mean that? Stand up with me. I have gotten correspondence from people all over the world as I travel, crying because they're trapped in one sin or another. And the thing about it, they hate what they're doing. Are you with me? They hate it. They come away feeling dirty and soiled. And they hate it, but they keep doing it. Why? They need a... You see, the power of sin is the power of Satan. <laughs> and Satan is the second greatest power in the universe. Only Christ, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are more powerful than Satan. You need the power of Christ. And you can conquer that sin through Christ. Whatever it is. Because with God, come on, tell me, nothing. Now say that positively. With God, all things are possible, including victory over our sins. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Straightforward and clear. If we will read honestly. For those under the sound of my voice, and I am under the sound of my own voice, we need divine help. Every day, the servant of the Lord tells us in the Desire of Ages, page 324, paragraph 1, without a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy. Without a moment-by-moment -moment surrender, we will do his will. Father, we've stood to give our lives to you 100%. Now, dear God, combine that divine power with our little faith. And let every man, every woman leave this building tonight convinced that victory over sin is not only possible, it is required. Oh, hasten the day when some of us will rejoice in that victory and that deliverance. Let angels take everyone safely home. Let that same angel remain in the home to protect. Bring us back tomorrow, dear God. But before we put our heads on that pillow, let us make all things right between you and us through confession. Again, bless all those who came. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen.